Many of the details in chapter six of this fictional book, The Night in Question, closely matches the evidence presented by prosecuting attorneys in trial. In the book, OJ says that something went horribly wrong at the crime scene and he can't remember how the murders actually happened. The book does say that he recalls seeing Nicole in the fetal position at the base of the stairs and Ron slumped up against a fence in a large pool of blood outside her home. Crime scene photos presented at the trial show two bodies positioned exactly the way that OJ described them in the book. Which I guess if you're going to write a fictional like book, I would assume that you would use pretty much the matching evidence at trial to make it somewhat like match the story. But OJ says that his book is a hypothetical account. Okay. Ron's family doesn't see it that way. Quote, we read it and felt very strongly that this is his way of sort of setting the record straight. He speaks publicly about the fact that he he hates people speaking on his own behalf, and he wanted an opportunity to tell it his way. Additionally, this isn't an innocent man writing a book like this. An innocent man doesn't write a book about how hypothetically he would decapitate the mother of his children. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. Now, remember, this book was released by Ron's family, not by OJ. But once the book was published, OJ had an interview with Judith Regan in 2006. In the interview, OJ confesses to the murders by hypothetically recounting every event. He also reveals that he hypothetically had an accomplice who helped him conduct these murders. And of course, watching him just kind of like spill all the beans, it kind of seems like this is his moment telling the truth. And I wonder who this accomplice accomplice is I'll tell you a story you've never heard before because no one knows this story the way i know it because i know the fact better than anyone no one knows the facts like he does okay i mean that's already like revving us up to i guess tell us exactly what happened seems like he's really excited the chapter chapter six is called the night in question mm -hmm. and you write in the book now picture this and keep in mind that this is Purely hypothetical. 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 Yes. Why don't you tell me what might have happened on the night of June 12th, 1994? <laughs> I, well, first of all, it's, this is very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because it's hypothetical. Not them preparing us with the, oh, it's hypothetical, it's hypothetical. Yeah, he's trying to make that very clear. And, that, you know, this is really hard for him to speak about, which he's saying this with a smile on his face. You reached under the seat for? Um, a knife. I always kept a knife in the hot car for the crazies and stuff because you can't travel with a gun. And I remember Charlie saying, you ain't bringing that. And I didn't, but I believe he took it. Charlie took the knife? Yeah. Okay, the way that he's now telling the story sounds like it's exactly him and Charlie doing this. It's also interesting that he adds that little tidbit of like, I, I actually always keep a knife, like a knife under my car because the crazies. Um, okay, that so matches, you know, with what we would expect from these murders. It appears like Nicole had, flock, I had candles all the time. She really did to keep her overhead down, I think. And music was on, and uh, while I was there, a guy shows up. You know? So Ron Goldman comes in the back gate. Yeah, a, a guy that I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. And I, in the mood I was in, I started having words with him. He says to you, I just came by to return a pair of glasses. Judy left them at the restaurant. You get into a fight. Nicole comes out. And a verbal, a verbal, a verbal fight. fight. Got a little loud, and by that time, uh, Nicole had come out, and we started having words about who is this guy, why is he here, what's going on. And, and she says, this is my house, get that the F out yeah, of here. Yes, and uh, which I didn't like because once again, this is the same person. And if you read the book, you'll see some things that happened in the two weeks leading up to this that were uh, very, very irritating. The way that he's telling this story, reminds me of me like telling a story, you know, I'm like, I'm like looking around kind of, you know, you're thinking, you're like trying to remember trying to remember and also the fact that he like it's not even like about the night of the, it's about like the lead up so like if he were to do it there were certain things that did could have happened that it sounds like he's saying they did happen weeks prior to this that were very irritating that pushed him over the edge and the way that this hypothetical story is depicting it sounds almost like just a you know him casually talking about this moment like i rolled up this guy ron was there we knew that he was super controlling he did not like the fact that another man was there it escalated he had his friend buddy already there already kind of like i mean it almost seems like premeditated meditated because like you know why would you even want to bring the knife as things got heated uh i just remember the coal fell and uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed a knife. I do remember that portion, taking a knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember 
except I'm standing there and there's all kind of stuff around. And um, I hate to say this, but this is hypothetical. Right, I'm sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. Right. It's <laughs> okay. Know? It actually makes me like stomach sick hearing him say like how he did the I remember. I remember doing this. Um, it just sounds like he's verbatim telling us. And the fact that he would black out, that's pretty like typical of people who do these kind of things. Like they are so enraged. Like even people who are domestic, you know, violent, you know, perpetrators, they also see red and they just, you know, black out and they go into this fit. And that's exactly what he's describing with a smile on his face, saying, like, I remember this, I remember that. If you're like you remember writing that. Or you remember telling the ghostwriter to like you made? I just what do you remember? Do you remember writing the story with the ghostwriter? Do you remember telling the ghostwriter this idea? Do you remember actually participating and committing this crime? Sounds like you're remembering this moment. Also, I want to point out the fact that he said that Ron did this karate thing, and uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, "Well, you think you can kick my ass?" Now, I want you guys to pay attention to this part. By stating that Rom performed a, quote, karate thing, OJ potentially revealed his involvement in the crime and his presence at the crime scene. This is majorly significant because Ron Goldman was a black belt, and how would OJ know that? Actually, the autopsy report revealed that Ron fought back before being brutally murdered. So it's really convenient that OJ knows exactly how this man would fight. And I also wonder if, like, the prosecution looked over this book and found additional evidence that would like suggest more i mean i feel like this is almost like a call for a mistrial because like he is giving us things that like he is admitting that only this person in that moment would know um you wrote in the book i had never seen so much blood in my life can you describe yeah, it I, I it's hard for me to describe it i'm telling you i don't think any two people could be um, murdered the way they were without everybody being covered in blood and of course, I think we've all seen the grisly pictures after. Still so insane to me how he is admitting to this crime scene and the blood being everywhere and to the fact that he could even do that to someone he once loved. You write about removing a glove before taking the knife from Charlie. Uh, you know, I had no conscious memory of doing that, but obviously I must have because they found a the glove there. And blacking out. Have mm -hmm. you ever blacked out before? Not to my knowledge. No. No, of course. Uh, of course, if something like this would take place in anybody's life, if it were to happen, I would imagine it's something that you would probably automatically uh, have trouble wrapping your your mind around it. There's also an element at play of him, like, convincing himself here. He's definitely convinced himself that he's, like, you know, it, almost that it seems like the murder would have been just. Like, he is an innocent man. Even retelling this story for clout, it just seems like he loves the attention for this, and he's, like... It, there's either no conscious or there's just like some real need for attention and this almost still gives him control over nicole in a way like controlling this story this narrative talking about it and making money from it you see bloody footprints and you decide to take off yes actually i, I believe charlie kept saying we gotta get out of here in the book you describe taking off your shoes your pants and your shirt and dropping it in a bundle uh yes do you remember what happened? because what next? are you gonna do with it <laughs> you know somebody's got to get rid of uh as you may have called during the trial, is that where are the bloody clothes? So somebody had to get rid of the bloody clothes. I like how this woman is interviewing him because she's like kind of like making him comfortable. I mean, he's obviously way too comfortable for someone who has gone through this. Um, but she's really asking these pointed questions that I feel like he would only know and would only make sense if he was present. So you get back in the car, put them yeah, in the bundle. and drove back, parked a block away because I knew the limo would be there and came across the backyard through the two tennis courts and, you know, came through the house. So you went through the neighbors? Neighbors, yeah. He had a tennis court and I had a tennis court. And you go into the house and... I, 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 I ran upstairs to take a shower. I actually ran upstairs and took some of my bags and came back downstairs and put them out front. You also probably notice the way that he's describing this in a non-theoretical way. Like, oh, if I were to, then I probably would have gone through this way. I probably would have gone, you know, washed my clothes and my, you know, got rid of the evidence and got cleaned up. I probably would have. There's no probably, there's pro no, like, it's just, I would have done, I did do that. He's not saying I would have, but he's saying I absolutely did do that. I went upstairs. I, I dropped a bag of clothes out at the front door, just quickly trying to clean himself up. When did you cut your finger? Um, to my knowledge, really, when I got the call the next morning, and this is 
the truth. Um, when I got the call the next morning saying that Nicole had been murdered, I mean, was killed, was dead. And I kept saying, what do you mean dead, uh, killed, or whatever the words they use? I said, what do you mean? And as well, we can't tell you anything. Uh, we're still investigating, but where are you? And when can you get back here? And, and I think I actually went in the bathroom and it was down on me. I was, I didn't really throw a glass. I just was, you know, you, 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 and when I was putting it down, I just, it just smashed, <laughs> you know? Police believed that the cuts on OJ's hand probably came from the fingernails of one of his victims. When he says the truth is, it's like, okay, well then I'm hearing you out. The truth is what? Tell us what the truth is. And he's saying that he like smashed like a glass and cut his fingers up. That seems awfully convenient.